The wisdom of God includes the aspect of preaching. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21, that the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Preaching involves a great deal, but part of that which it includes certainly is God's plan to save sinful mankind. That God, before the world began even, knew that man would sin, and in that condition he would need reconciling to himself. And so God planned a way for man, sinful man, to be saved from his sins which included the death of Jesus Christ and the establishment of the church. God began even at the beginning when Adam and Eve sinned, began revealing to man that plan. And it was, of course, culminated when Christ, in the fullness of time, comes to this world and dies upon the cross for sinful mankind. Then this church being established in Acts the second chapter. And so in that, we see God's grace being extended to man. But God also requires man to do his part in that salvation process. That because Christianity is a taught and a learned religion, that man must hear the gospel. He must hear the truth. Because it is by hearing that faith is developed. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 and verse uh, 6. Likewise, man must believe. He must have faith. And while some contend that faith is something that God gives unto man, faith comes instead by the Word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. And faith is then based upon the evidence, the knowledge that comes through that teaching process. I come to have knowledge of something, and because of my knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ and His death upon the cross, the purpose of that death, that I come to believe, I come to have faith. That faith causes me to repent of my sins, which we looked at last week. The aspect of repentance is that man realizes that he has sinned, that he has transgressed God's nature and God, and thus he has, within him, he develops a desire to live according to God's revealed will, and thus the need for repentance. But repentance, as we looked at, is an honestly, fervently, sincerely seeking the favor of God. It's done by having godly sorrow that is produced first by our realization of our guilt and our condemnation. It comes as a result of a knowledge of God's law. I know that I have transgressed what God said, thus a knowledge of God's work, of God's law. It is as a result of an abiding faith and love for God and His will, along with a sincere sense of personal responsibility. I realized I am the one that has committed sin. And thus, while repentance is based upon that godly sorrow, it then demands a turning from that sinful way of life. But it's not simply a turning from that sinful way of life. It is a turning from it to a turning to God. It has to be done in God's appointed way, how God has showed us to turn to Him. It's based upon our desire to do right and to be right with God. This then change leads to a change in life. Our actions are changing. And then, in making that change, we try to make restitution in as far as possible, in whatever righteous way is possible. 
Likewise, man needs to confess his faith. Romans 10, verses 9 and verse 10 in particular. And confession is very simply a saying what God has said. God said, this is my son. We make a confession. We say with God that Jesus is the son of God. And thus we say the same thing as the father said. But now then, in our study this morning, we want to at least begin don't know if we'll conclude this, but the fact that man must be baptized in relationship to that salvation process. Baptism is a burial or an immersion. If you look at the dictionary, the dictionary defines baptism as to dip a person into or sprinkle with water. Now, thus, dipping or sprinkling with water would be, according to the dictionary, defined as baptism. We need to realize when we use a dictionary that it is not giving us the meaning of a word. If you turn to a dictionary, its intent is not to give you the meaning of that word. If you're looking for that, then you need to look elsewhere many times. Now, in a complete dictionary, unabridged, will give you the actual meaning of the word along with what dictionaries do today, the application of the word, the usage of the word. How is this word being used today? That's why dictionaries, if it was just giving you the meaning of the word, there wouldn't need a, to have a dictionary coming out every year or every few years. What you would have is one dictionary, and that would be the end of it, because it would give you the definition, and that's all you were looking for. Dictionaries don't give the definition. They give the usage. How is it being used today? And because words change meaning over time, a word that might mean something five years ago might mean something different today. And so a dictionary comes out and gives you the usage, how that word is being used. If you look at baptism, people in calling this baptism do sprinkle or they pour and some immerse, and all of it is called baptism. So if you look at the dictionary definition, the dictionary definition, di dictionary definition is giving you the usage of the term, and that is the way in which it's used. But again, dictionaries are not designed to give you the definition of a word. It's design is to give you the usage of the word. To look at baptism, you really need to go back to see what the Bible word is. And li literally, baptism is a transliteration of the Greek word. Now understand the difference between transliteration and translation. The translators of the Bible, when they came to this Greek word, did not translate the word. They transliterated it. And let me just, as an aside here, I, every once in a while, I come across this, that blaming the King James translators for the transliteration of baptism instead of translation of it. And that if they had only translated it, well, the problem is, I, when, one time when I heard that, I went back and I looked at several translations, English translations, that were prior to the King James translation in 1611. Every one of them that I found, without exception, always used the word baptism. 
it was a common word in usage at the time of the King James translation. They chose that word. Yes, it is a transliteration. Now then, what's the difference? Translating is you have a word in the original language and you give its meaning in a new language. The original language in this case is Greek. Our language, English, would be the sometimes called the target language. So you have the Greek word, and it's translated. It is the meaning is brought over to the English language. Transliteration is different, though. Transliteration does not give you the meaning of a word. Transliteration takes the letters of the original language and uses those lang uh, letters into a target language, or in this case, the English language. The Greek word comes from baptizmo, and they took the Greek letters and made an English word baptism. That's the way in which we would use the Greek word baptizmo. Thus, you can't even really look at the Greek or the English translation baptism for the meaning of the Greek word. But when you look at the lexicons, lexicon's intention is, when it's a Greek lexicon, to go to that Greek language and look at the word and tell us what the word actually means. And again, we could even use the illustration that because words change meaning over time, we have to look really when you're looking at a Greek lexicon and make sure that you're looking at a time frame in which the New Testament was being written. Um, and so to do that, there are several Greek lexicons. Art and Gingrich was one of the best. Now then, it has been updated, um, and someone else included in that. It was actually a revision of Bauer's uh, lexicon that was done in the uh, German, and they translated Bauer's into English along with revising it. Art and Gingrich did. did. And they said it means to dip, to immerse. And thus we start learning the meaning of baptism. Vine, another dictionary of the Greek language, said consisting of the process of immersion, submersion, and emergence. And then he mentions it's from bapto, meaning to dip. Thus, immersion, that's going down into, submersion means completely submerging one, and emergence is coming up out of, or coming up out of that element. So he says it consists of that process, that threefold process, going down into immersion, submersion, completely submerging one, and then coming up, or emergence, coming up out of that element. So he says it's comprised, or this baptism is comprised of all three. Little Kittles, it's an abbreviation of the ten-volume book, uh, ten volumes of Kittle's uh, dictionary says to dip in or under, to die, to immerse, to sink, to drown, to bathe, wash, using all of those terms in which to describe this act of baptism. Thayer that we hear quite a bit about. Um, his dictionary says to dip repeatedly, to emerge, submerge. Uh, now I could get several others, and basically they would all say essentially the same thing. 
there's not going to be an element of maybe a different word here and there, a different emphasis, but it's basically going to say the same thing, that baptism means to dip or to plunge, to be under, to submerge, and use terms such as that. It's interesting, though, that if the Greek writers wanted to express the idea of sprinkling or pouring, as is seen in our modern usage of the word baptism, they had words to express those ideas. They were not limited to the word baptism. If they wanted to express the idea of sprinkling, they could have used the Greek word rantizo. It means literally to sprinkle. And so, instead of using baptizmo or one of its forms, they could have used this word rantizo, but they didn't. They do not use rantizo for the act of baptism. If they wanted to express the idea of pouring, they had actually a couple of words that they could choose, balo or keo. Both of those ideas express the idea of pouring. And so if they wanted to express those ideas that people refer to as baptism today, they could have used these words, rontizo, balo, or keo, but they didn't use those words. They used a word which means to submerge or to em to completely cover over, to dip or to plunge. That's the words that they used, not these others. And so we start learning the idea of baptism, but if we don't know Greek, we can still learn the aspect of what baptism is all about. In John the third chapter, it's talking about John the Baptist. And in, in verse 23 of John 3, it says that John also was baptizing in Anon, near to Salem, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. Now then, he was going, or he was baptizing at this location. Why? Because there's much water. So we can thus learn from this passage that baptism that takes much water. Now, if I am going to sprinkle some water on someone, I don't need very much water in order to sprinkle water on someone. The same thing can be said in relationship to pouring. If I'm going to pour waters upon someone, it doesn't take a lot of water in order to pour water on someone. If um, you can take a glass of water and pour it on them, that's not much water. Um, those things don't demand much water. But... For John to baptize, he was baptizing in this location, Anon, which was near to Salem, for the reason that there was much water there. It takes a great deal of water in order to baptize someone. In Acts the 8th chapter, here's the, the events of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And Philip began preaching Christ unto him. It says that they came to a certain water and he wanted to be baptized and Philip's response was, if you believe, you can, and he makes a good confession. In verse 38 and verse 39 then it says, he commanded the chariot to stand still and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Now, I will admit that I used to, for, and for years, I misread this passage. I took it as the 
went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and then coming up out of the water, that that was the part of, that that was the aspect of baptism. It's not. It took for baptism to take place a going down into the water before the baptism. While they were now in the water, he baptizes him. After the baptism, then they leave the water. They come up out of the water. Baptism took place, though, after they got into the water. Why did they need to get into the water if it all, all it takes is a little bit of water to sprinkle on him or to pour a little bit of water? Why didn't they get something and just pour a little bit of water on him? Why did they need to go down into the water? Why didn't they need both of them to get in the water? If all is necessary is to sprinkle or pour water upon someone. You see... Sprinkling and pouring is not consistent with what the text is actually saying. In order to baptize in this situation, they had to go down into the water first. Then after the baptism, then they were able to come up out of the water. There was no need to go down into the water or to come up out of the water if all it takes is sprinkling or pouring. But those actions are necessary if you're going to immerse someone, if you're going to put them under the water, submerge them in water. And so we learn a little bit. It, that's why it takes much water, because there has to be a complete submerging, submerging of the individual in water. Then we also learn from the aspect of it being referred to as a burial. In Acts, or Romans, the sixth chapter, verses three and verse four, it says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into the, his death? Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism, or by baptism, into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, Ye also, by the glory of God, even so we also should walk in newness of life. There is a burial with him in baptism or by baptism. Baptism is thus being referred to as a burial. Colossians, the second chapter in verse 12, we also see that figure buried with him in baptism. Wherein ye also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. In both passages, baptism is described as a burial. And it's been beautifully illustrated that if an animal on the farm dies and the father tells the young child his son, go bury that animal. If the child simply gets a little bit of dirt and sprinkles some dirt on it, and, well, it won't be long till there's a smell around that uh, the father learns, you didn't bury it. You just sprinkled some dirt on it. I told you to bury it. Why? Because we understand that a burial is putting him, that animal under the ground. We do the same thing with humans. When we bury them, we put them under the ground, um, supposedly six feet deep. Why? Because that's what a burial is. It is a complete submerging under the element here in relationship to humans or an animal that's died would be under the dirt, under the ground, but it's a complete submerging of that animal or that person who has died. Now then, he's using that in relationship to, to our salvation process. We are buried. What does that imply? That implies a complete submersion in something. And thus we have that connection in relationship to that burial is baptism. Thus, the, the action itself, the emphasis of the Scriptures, is 
a going down into water to be completely submerged in that water. But that gets me to the next point, actually, and I already gave the answer. The element is water. In John 3, 23, again, where John was baptizing in Anon near to Salem because there was much water there. They came and were baptized. The element is water, not some other substance. Baptism by itself does not imply water. Even like burial, buried with him by baptism, does not imply water. All it implies is a submerging, in, submerging into something. Uh, that's why, in fact, the Scriptures do refer to a baptism in relationship to suffering. For example, Jesus referred to, I have a baptism to be baptized with. It was a baptism of suffering. There's the baptism of fire that John mentions in Matthew, the third chapter. So the element is not necessarily set forth by the word baptism. You have to look elsewhere in order to find the element. We start finding the element in relationship to the act of baptism in John 3.23 in John's action. But what about Christian baptism? Some individuals want to hold that we're baptized in the Spirit today. And most of those would also argue that we are baptized in fire at the same time, having a misunderstanding of the baptism of fire. Baptism of fire that John talks about was a baptism of being totally immersed in eternal punishment. A fire. Just read the context. Matthew, the third chapter, starting in about verse 10 and going through 12. But Christian baptism, what is it? What's the element? Is it spirit or is it water? Well, in Acts the 8th chapter that we just read in relationship to Philip and the Ethiopian, the element that they went down into was water. The baptism takes place in water. They then come up out of the water. The element thus is water. It's not spirit. If the element was simply spirit, baptism, as the Pentecostals would have us to believe today, then there would be no reason to go into the water. There would be no reason to come up out of the water because there wouldn't be a need to go into the water because baptism would be done in the spirit and not in the water. There's a distinction that's set forth, and the element thus is that element of water. In Ephesians 4, uh, chapter, Paul gives us seven ones. Among those ones is one baptism. There is one baptism. Now, while there might have been other baptisms prior to that time, and there were, when Paul writes this in Ephesians 4, the book of Ephesians thus, at that point in time, there's only one. Which one is it? Is it water or is it spirit? Now, it's important for us to understand because we are being commanded to be baptized. What element are we to be baptized in? Is it water or is it spirit? There's only one now, Paul says. So which is it? Well, if I can find out which one it is after Paul writes that there's only one, while there might have been several prior to that, there's only one now. If I can find which one it is after he writes that, I now know what that one baptism is that Paul speaks of in Ephesians 4 and verse 4. So the question then is, is there a biblical passage that shows us the element into which one is baptized after Paul writes Ephesians 4 and, uh, that there is one baptism. And guess what? Peter wrote his two books after Paul writes the book of Ephesians. And in 1 Peter, the third chapter, 
Peter talks about and is describing the days of Noah. That the, during the days of Noah, people were disobedient, which sometimes were disobedience. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing. So here's God's long suffering while at that period of time in which it took Noah to build that ark. Wherein few souls, that is eight souls, were saved by water. So here's Noah and that illustration that he's using. And here's the people who were disobedient during the days of Noah. God's long suffering was there during the time in which Noah was building the ark. And then Noah and his family, the eight souls, were saved by water. Now then, he says, that becomes a type of our salvation. Verse 21. The like figure. This was a figure. A figure of what? Salvation. Here is Noah and his family being saved, how? By water. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Well, here is Noah, he was saved by water. That's a figure of our salvation, Peter says. What is it? It is salvation by water. And then he goes on to set forth what it's not, in a parenthetical statement, it's not simply the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Well, no, it's not what we would refer to as taking a bath. It is, instead, the cleansing of the soul. It's the answer of a good conscience toward God. And then he says that this salvation comes by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What is that baptism, though? We're saved by baptism... It's not Holy Spirit baptism here. It's water salvation. Water salvation under Noah. Baptism saves us. What is that baptism? The element has to be water in order for that to be a figure of our salvation. A type of our salvation. And so Peter very clearly sets forth what the element is as far as today. There's other aspects in which we could study in relationship to water salvation or salvation by or water baptism or spirit baptism. For example, water baptism was a command. Spirit baptism was a promise. In fact, it was a promise that was given just to and limited to the, Holy, to the apostles in Acts, the first chapter. Some uh, water baptism was commanded for all people everywhere. Holy Spirit baptism was a promise that was given just to the apostles and no one else in reality. Thus, it's not Holy Spirit that we're baptized into today. It is the element is water that we're baptized in. And let's add, in relationship to 1 Peter 3, verse 20 and 21, we should not be ashamed to say that we're saved by water. Water saves us, yes. Are we saved by water alone? No. There is a doctrine that we are accused of believing, baptismal regeneration. Now there is an element of truth in the term, that phraseology, but there is an usage of that terminology that is false. Baptismal regeneration. Regeneration is new birth. New birth process involves baptism, so baptismal regeneration is true. If you just look at the words. That's not being how it is used though. What we are accused of teaching is that baptism is all that is necessary to salvation or to be regenerated. That there's nothing else involved in it. And that's false. As we've already noted in these previous lessons and as we reviewed this morning. 
it takes hearing God's word. It takes faith on our part. It takes our uh, repentance. It takes our confession. And so it takes other things other than just being immersed in water. But we should not shy away from the aspect that it takes immersion in water in order to be saved, and salvation does come by baptism. Don't let them misuse, though, what we teach in relationship to that. Baptism is not all that there is. They want to teach faith only and thus accuse us of believing in baptism only. Well, both positions would be false and should be argued against and fought against. It takes both faith and it takes baptism to be saved. It's not only anything. Lord willing, next week, we'll continue in this study of baptism. We'll look who it's for, and thus what it does, its purpose. And then we'll conclude with, uh, Lord willing, next week, our need to be faithful in relationship to that salvation process. But to be saved... From our past sins, it takes this act of baptism. Based upon, yes, hearing God's word and that allowing that word to produce faith in us. Based upon the fact that we repent of our sins. And that means, again, turning to God in God's way. Doing what God says. It takes our confession of our faith that we say that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then that act of baptism completes that process of the forgiveness of our past sins, the salvation. And so if you have not obeyed that gospel plan that God has established for us, we would encourage you to do that this morning. If you have, but you haven't continued in that faithfulness to God, as we'll look at, Lord willing, next Sunday, then repent of your sins and come back unto faithfulness in Him. And start putting Him first within your life. So if we can help you in these things, we would encourage you to come as we stand and sing the invitation song.